action. Today is the what date? Marty, what date is it? Today is the 12th. The 12th, two days after the season finale. Do we What, just let me make sure. Ah. Sucks, doesn't do it, we should have done film. Oh, sorry, Derek, you can't be in here. You're not in there. Giancarlo Esposito, uh, hailing all the way from Copenhagen, Denmark. He drove here. <laughs> Thank you. That was one of my things. Uh, it's actually, that's where he was born. His family moved here when he was a much younger man. He hit Broadway at age eight. Do I have this correct? Yeah. You okay. Did good. Working with, I want to say, Shirley Jones. And since then, it's been a long, strange trip, if I can use an overused uh, deadhead phrase. Um, 130 television uh, slash movies on camera, he's been in. He's worked with everybody, this guy, okay? You name that person, he's worked with him or her. But he's also been behind the camera. He's a director, he's a producer. This guy is the real deal. And we're very lucky to have him, and he's very nice in showing up here. And he brought one of his babies with him, and by that I mean one of the movies that he directed. And he's going to talk to us about directing and some of his choices. And then he's going to talk about whatever he wants to. Um, and I guess, I think some questions about Breaking Bad may come up. I can't. <laughs> I can't spare that. That's a yes or no. But um, upon this, I'm going to turn it over to you and get out of your way. Oh, thanks so much, John. It's, it's, uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, especially because you guys are uh, studying film. And to me, uh, film is an absolutely wonderful medium that helps us to learn about who we are and about um, who we aren't. Uh, when you start to look at the places that film can take us, you're, you really start to get an understanding that you can be transformed 
uh, and learn about uh, many different societies and cultures around the world, film seems to be more and more the universal language uh, of how we are able to be fully immersed in someone else's culture or someone else's idea of storytelling. And what I love about what I do is that we tell stories. And that is essential to feed our imaginations. Uh, it, it's a gift that we get from folks who uh, maybe want their freedom in certain countries. Documentary filmmaking has become so strong because people have sort of exposed uh, the situation that they live in, in the country that they're in of origin. Uh, and sometimes that kind of exposure allows the world to know what's going on in that particular place. And that helps facilitate a large amount of change uh, politically, economically, culturally, uh, spiritually. So film is a very sensitive medium, and it's it's one of the very thing one of the, one of the greatest things that I love about it, and is the reason why I became a filmmaker uh, of, on my own. Now I look at filmmaking overall uh, as when I started, I became an actor at a very young age. I was seven and a half years old when I started on the Broadway stage. I didn't know a lot about film at that time. And at that moment in my development, uh, I developed a talent to be singing and dancing and uh, on the Broadway stage and loved performing because it, it moved me. It helped me uh, in my own personal growth and development. Uh, I enjoyed it because it moved people from one place to another. And I enjoyed the theater because it's very much like this. You know, you're, you're in front of a live audience and you get a chance to really uh, know and feel immediately whether or not you're connecting with that audience or not. Film is a different medium. So for years, uh, and I'm going to give you a quick background of just how I got into it so you can understand a little bit about my um, personal taste and about what keeps me involved uh, now that I've become a filmmaker and what takes me back to the theater uh, because I still consider myself a theater actor. So after years of being um, in the musical comedy industry, um, John had mentioned, uh, Mr. Swanwick had mentioned that I was uh, uh, did a show with Shirley Jones and Jack Cassidy called Maggie Flynn. That was back in 1967. And that was my first professional Broadway show. And it helped me to really get a sense of um, what performing theatrically was like. Uh, I did 13 Broadway musicals between the time I was 7 years old and the time I was 17. And it, it was a fantastic experience, not only for me uh, in terms of learning how to perform, but also uh, learning how it worked, how to be able to communicate. So when you take everything back and you think about what you're trying to do, whether it be on stage, uh, in television, or in film, you're communicating. And getting back to linking up why I still do it is because I love good stories. And I think we are now returning to some really awesome stories uh, in smaller um, venues like cable television. Thus, you know, Breaking Bad, uh, a, a, a show that's not on a network channel but has uh, developed and really fostered telling good stories so that people can sort of get immersed in those stories and really enjoy them and be moved from one place to another. So that sort of um, encapsulates a certain part of my acting life. So for me, uh, I was born in Copenhagen in 50, 1958 to a... Uh, uh, a, an African-American mother, an Italian father, which put me in a, a unique position uh, growing up, seeing two sides of two different cultures um, come together. And it took me a long time to sort of understand that, uh, to really you know, try to get with my name, um, Giancarlo Giuseppe Alessandro Esposito, a very Italian name. And, and that was, it, it all worked fairly well until I came to America uh, in 62, and there was a whole different vibration happening in, in America. There was, there was the whole Martin Luther King was speaking. I was exposed to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., John F. Kennedy, who my mother really, really adored, trying to bring some peace to this country and bring people together. And it was a difficult time for me because people recognized I had an Italian name, although they wanted to label me as Spanish, because it was just easier to do that, uh, to get their heads wrapped around that, and because my name sounds a little Spanish. Uh, but I was in a unique position when I came to America to see, to observe. And it's important, you know, to sort of get with what that means. You know, film is an observance. You know, theater is an observance. You're, you're taking certain steps to sort of be 
um, open enough to observe a situation, observe something that moves you from one place to another story again. Uh, and so for me, that time really impressed me because I had to learn that there was a separation in, in the U.S. between black and white at that time. And I didn't really understand what that was. I knew what it meant in Europe before I came here. There was racism that I was sort of, was sort of presented to me, and the choice was to either accept that or not. And so my growth has been one of um, a great sort of spiritual growth in a way. Uh, and I mention all this because I, I, in 1980, I decided that I wanted to be a dramatic actor. And that changed my life. I love musical comedy, but I looked around me and all my friends were, uh, were performing on Broadway in shows that were specific to African Americans. Um, there was Ben Marine who was um, doing Pippin. Uh, there were, I had a few friends in Curly Victorious. And I wanted to become an actor who could extend myself to a larger audience. I didn't want to just be labeled an African American song and dance guy. And that's what may help me to move from the theater, uh, musical comedy, to straight drama. And that was really the beginning of my journey. Uh, I did a play with Charles Fuller in 1980 called Zoo Man and the Sign, a really profound and provocative play about a young man who uh, was a numbers dealer on the street. And he was after a rival numbers dealer. The whole play took place in Philadelphia, where Charles was from, and he accidentally shot a little girl. And, uh, and the play is really very profound. It's been made into a PBS television piece. Uh, and so I learned in that play how to act. And I woke up one morning, and it was opening night, and I went and did my opening night as if, and took it just like every other rehearsal or preview um, of the show. And I was plastered all over the New York papers as, as arriving as a dramatic actor. And for me, that was the beginning of my um, entrance into film. I had done some film as an extra, uh, someone who moves in and out of scenes, and maybe might be seen in the background, but I had never done film as a uh, supporting artist or as an ensemble actor. And it wasn't until I did Zoom In and Sign, then right around that time, I got an audition for my first feature film called Taps, that starred Timothy Hutton and Sean Penn, and made Tom Cruise what he is. Uh, and it's a great story about Tom in, in, in this regard, and that he was never meant to play the role he played. But there was another actor named Donald Kilmel who just wasn't doing it, and the director, Harold Becker, his first feature film as a director, he was a commercial director, um, recognized that Tom had a quality that might work for this role, and he switched both of these guys around, and Tom came through in that part in a beautiful way, and it launched his career. Uh, but I tell you all this to tell you why I wanted to become a dramatic actor. One, I wanted to be able to uh, reach a larger audience, and two, I wanted to cultivate a talent I thought I had inside me, but was very, very different from my experience as a musical comedy artist, as a singer and a dancer. The focus was different. And I'll tell you one little story that will guide me into the rest of my film life, and that is, so I went to do this movie called Taps, I went to audition, and I auditioned for a gal named Shirley Rich. She was a casting director. A lot of times you have casting directors will come in and say, oh, you look like you could do this part. And they come and, will you come and read? And they give you a couple of pages of sides to read. And I read these sides for Shirley, and she looked at me and she said, you know, and you got to remember now, oh, I'll remind you, that this is a time I had already been acting for at least, at least 10 years. And Shirley looked up over, she read with me, and she said, you know, John Carla, you really have to, you should probably go away and learn how to act. And I was crushed, devastated. I had been on the stage since I was seven years old. And then she said, well, you, you know how to act. It's that you don't know how to act for film. And that is a different way of acting. And everything you're doing is too big. It's reaching the, the back row. Your, your, your voice is very modulated. I'm a singer, you got to remember. That's what I'm used to. My, allowing my presence and my voice to reach everyone in the room so that you don't have to strain to hear me so you have an opportunity to sort of get what I'm saying and put it together in your own brain. So I was, needless to say, very sad, and I went away crushed that I wasn't going to get a call back or an opportunity to do this movie. Uh, and I went away and I did straight drama. I did two plays down at the Henry Street Settlement, uh, and I, a year later I got a phone call 
it was from my agent who said there's a film called Taps, which is shooting soon. I said, wait a minute, I auditioned for that last year. I didn't get it. Uh, and the agent said to me, well, you know what? Um, it never got made. So you have another opportunity. So I went in to read again with the same gal, Shirley Rich, and this time she gave me the size and she read the other part and uh, she looked up over her glasses and she said, wow, what have you been doing? And I said, I've been doing what you told me to do. I've done three, two to three plays down at Henry Street Settlement, um, straight dramas, and I've, I've learned to sort of take it down a bit to allow the camera to enter my world as opposed to me trying to impose myself on the camera. And uh, she said, that's really excellent, John Carlo. Would you come back at 12 o'clock and read for our producer and our director? And I said, sure. Came back at 12, read again. And uh, the director chased me out of the room. And the producer chased me out of the room, Stanley Jaffe. He was a big guy at 20th Century Fox. And he said, would you come back at 2 o'clock and read with our star? <laughs> I said, OK, I'll come back at 2 o'clock. So at 2 o'clock, I came back. And there was one other actor there who I was familiar with at the time, and he saw me and he got a little nervous. And I, I imagine it was between me and him, and I didn't pay, I said hi, and didn't pay any more attention to it, and went in and did my best, and after that reading, the, the producer and director ran out of the room and said, hey, would you do this? Would you do this movie? I said, yeah, what are you kidding me? Of course I'll do this movie. And, and that was my first feature film that I did opposite Tim Hutton. I came back at two and I read with Tim Hutton. I never knew who he was, uh, and we've been friends. Uh, very close friends ever since that moment, um, which is about, gosh, it's got to be about 30 years now. So I tell you that to give you this overview really quickly of, of, uh, of my growth. So I went off and did TAPS. I had gone to a military school in Newburgh, New York, called Mount St. Joseph Military Academy. I knew a lot about um, the world we didn't have it, uh, where we shot at King of, in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, at Valley Forge Military Academy. And then, but I didn't know that I would start to fall in love. And that love affair with film began then. Because it was my first feature film that was, had a really large budget. So they had all the bells and whistles and all, um, they were shooting on, on in Panavision, and they were, it was not digital, it was film. There were some wonderful actors in the film. I already mentioned Tom Cruise and Sean Penn certainly was a dynamic and wonderful actor coming up at the time. Uh, and George C. Scott was in that movie. So I got a chance to sort of learn film from the best, observing the um, attention that was paid to making this particular movie. And I started to ask questions. Being an actor, many times you want to know, you know, how much am I in this? You know, when you get a script, you look for all your lines and see if you're in it, if you have a, 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 a substantial part. And, uh, and I stopped doing that right around this time. I started to see the whole picture. And for me to move from being an actor into the film world, and there was a reason. The reason that really hooked me was obviously, I've already mentioned the story. Uh, it was also about trying to get to a wider audience. Um, but it was also that film is a director's medium. Film is, is something that is maybe one or two people's vision. The writer, coming from theater, I put a lot of credit or put a lot of emphasis on the word. To me, when you read a great poet, you're looking at something that that person has channeled through them. They, they've written this piece in their own words from their own heart. So to me, that's always been very, very important to relate to. Um, a lot of actors like to improvise. Now, I've talked about theater and I've talked about film. The major thing that I found while working on TAPS with film actors who weren't exposed to doing theater was that they were less disciplined. That they, they would um, oftentimes think it was okay to paraphrase the author, the writer. They would oftentimes only need to or want to remember those couple of pages that they're going to shoot that day on a film. To give you an example, um, on a major feature film, you would probably more than likely shoot three pages a day. That's all. Two and a half, three pages a day. On a television show, we haven't gotten into television yet, but when you're doing a television show, you're shooting seven, eight, maybe nine pages a day. In the theater, you rehearse for, normally, when I started in theater, we'd rehearse, rehearse between four and six weeks of rehearsal every single day, nine and 10 hours a day, 
before you put the show up, which meant before you had the opportunity to go from beginning to, get, to, beginning to end over and over again so you understood how the musical or the play flowed. And then after that, then you invite in people. And then you do previews so that you could get a sense of whether or not it's working structurally, comedically, uh, if you're getting a reaction. Uh, so for me, uh, in, in telling the story becomes very important. And I was, I'm always very cognizant, pay a lot of attention to the word. And I want to say those words in the vein uh, with, in, with which they were written. Um, I had a great experience two, three years ago to do uh, a play in New York uh, by Tennessee Williams and called Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And it was a play that was really, it's a wonderfully written play, but when I started to learn more about the author uh, who has written some great American dramas, really great, uh, and the history of this particular piece, he never wanted the play to be performed by African Americans. He never wanted that to be allowed. It was something that he felt would not service his play. And then you have to look at the time period that he grew up in and the racism that was going on at that time. Uh, and his estate wouldn't allow the play ever to be done by African Americans until finally the executor of his estate passed away and there was a new executor and they considered allowing James Earl Jones and Felicia Rashad and um, Terrence Howard and myself do, to do this play with the agreement that they wouldn't change one word. So you know, what I'm trying to get at here is the universal ability uh, of the written word, theater, film, television, to change people's lives. They're slaves in the play. And it, the play was written for white folks, takes place down south in the 50s. And we did the play without changing one word. We even had the same, we had slaves, we had you know, darker skinned blacks and lighter skinned blacks. But it gives you an example of how transcendent Tennessee Williams' words were and could be because the play is ultimately about a family, as is the television show I'm doing now called Breaking Bad, which some of you may be familiar with. That's about the American family. To me, it really is. It's about Walter White and his journey to, from being a regular Joe, uh, a school teacher, a science teacher, to being uh, a math kingpin. But it's also the story, the backstory about what's going on now. What's going on in our country? You know, what's happening economically? Why people are struggling to survive? What they would do to survive? And to what lengths they might go to feed their family, as in Walter White's case, as in probably many of your parents' case. They have to find a way to keep food on the table, keep you guys stimulated, and keep you moving forward in your life. So here again, I draw analogies from film, theater, television, to the real world. I love doing this play. It got wonderful reviews, and it was around for a little bit, and it showed us that, that many times uh, there can be a universal message in theater, and especially and specifically in film. Anyone know how many viewers last week's finale of Breaking Bad? I think it was 2.9. 2.9 million people. Uh, you know, it's a lot of people. Uh, quite, quite a few people to be able to take in one episode of a television show. Uh, even though it was over those three viewings, 10, 11, and 12, it's still very, very strong and very powerful. So, for me, I fell in love with the story. Uh, I decided I wanted to make film, and it was at the time that I was doing taps that I started paying more attention. So I would always ask the director of photography, um, the DP, the guy who sets the lights, helps the director set his shot. Uh, I would always ask, what lens are you on? What are you seeing? Are you here? Are you here? And he would tell me, so I'd know, because it played into what Shirley Rich said to me, that my, all of my acting was too big, it was too theatrical. So if I know he's on this lens, or if I know he's on this lens, I know what I have to do. I can modulate my performance. I can do a whole lot less if he's here than if he's really, really wide. And sometimes you know, you'll hear director of photography directors say, oh, you're really small in the frame, it's really wide, don't worry. And some actors don't act then because Harvey Keitel is one of those guys. You know, he doesn't act unless he's here. It's here. Otherwise, he's lazy. Um, but <laughs> it's the truth. Uh, you know, he doesn't give you anything. But when you get in on him, he starts to perform. I like to try to practice on all those levels before they get here so that I have a sense of how I'll modulate myself or leave myself alone more. There's a saying. 
for actors is that you try to leave yourself alone. And I'd say it, it, it's applicable to being a director or any other part of the film business. When you sort of get out of your own way and channel what your vision may be, then you have greater success. And that is really the key. The key to being in the film business is operating as a family. And not many people refer to it that way. I do because of the experience of my first film. Uh, the experience with taps, the experience with asking what lenses, how to compose a shot, that all led me to making my first feature film called Gospel Hill, which took a long time. And it was three and a half years in the process just with the writer to get the story right. So as I understand it, you guys here are going to have to make a short film, a five minute film. You might be a little bit daunted by that. Um, when, when do you guys have to do that? you have to do that soon? Their, their actual film is due, I believe, uh, April 10th or so. Uh-huh. So we're, we're in the early stages right now. We're still pitching ideas on each other. Uh-huh. 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 So you, April. April soon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> really soon. What are you going to shoot on? What, are you, what kind of equipment do you have? We have uh, mini digital. What are they like? Back there. There's one hanging back this there. This one here that's on? It's real me? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, anyone have any ideas of what they want to do? Yeah. There's any ideas. We're still throwing stuff around. We, we all have a book that we write down ideas in. And I, don't, I don't know, but I don't know yet. It's hard to choose. It is hard to choose, and, and that is the ultimate job of a director. My, I became a director in uh, 07. I had directed some plays on and off Broadway. No, not on Broadway, off Broadway. Uh, and I had a desire to direct film for the last 20 years. The, the material that came to me, I had three offers, were, was not good enough for me to do only because it didn't, it didn't resound inside of me. And I, although I wanted to direct very badly, I realized one thing, and that's what kept me in the game, um, I think this is my 47th year as an actor. Uh, what kept me in the game as an actor was having the passion and really loving what I do. And I, I say this because I think it's one of the most important things you can garner from me being here today. Whether you're a fan of Breaking Bad, whether you just love my work or just love film or just impressed with some star walking into the room, the thing I want to tell you is you should be in it because you love it. That's the only thing that's going to bring you the most joy. Um, lately, I, my phone has been ringing off the hook because of Breaking Bad, and I have to keep bringing myself back to um, calm myself down, get myself rooted in the earth, and say, this is all great that people are recognizing what I do as having had an effect on them, but the most important thing is that it's had an effect on me, that I'm proud of what I do, that I still love it, that I'm still connected to it, and that I try not to do anything that I don't feel inside. So um, it's an interesting time for me in that I may have the opportunity now, with all this attention, to, to get some roles that I've always wanted to get, play some different kind of characters that I've wanted to play, maybe that people haven't seen that I'm able to do. So, getting back to film, my whole journey has been, um, it's been circuitous in a way, because I've had one career, and now I'm developing my second career. And the second career is to be a director. And being a director, you have to make a lot of choices. And I'm, a, I'm the kind of person who, when you go to the diner over here, um, it's difficult for me with that long menu to, to figure out what I want to eat. So how am I going to make choices for you know 200 people, cast, crew, actors, and be able to direct? How do you do that? Well, you have to feel it. You have to know your material. You have to really listen to suggestions. And it's important for you to have the passion to want to tell this story um, beyond just your head, but also in your heart. And that's what I learned uh, doing Gospel Hill. So, film is, do you guys know Marshall McClone? Do you, do, you, do you study him at all? The guy who was uh, back in television in the 30s? Film is a hot medium. So the hot medium is big screen. And Marshall McClellan sort of coined this. Television is a cool medium, small screen. Um, so when you start to look at yourself or how are you going to make something that's projected in a very, very large way, 
you have a different perspective. Things are shot differently for television than they are for film. Film is much broader, it's much larger, it gives you a more panoramic view, and you can do more with it. Uh, and so when you start to observe the differences between television and film, you start to get the idea of how to create something that someone's going to watch on some kind of a screen. There are many different areas of film. For you to know all of them is fairly impossible unless you're really, really galvanized, interested, and really connected to it. And that's why I say film is a, it, I call my filmmakers, the people that work with me, to, to, who made this film with me, Gospel Hill, some of whom I'll work with again, I call them a family of filmmakers. Because certain people are really, really good with the camera, as I was. I went to UA Columbia um, right around the time that cable television was coming up. Um, and I did my internship at New Rochelle at a cable company called UA Columbia. I was going to Elizabeth Seton College in Yonkers, New York, and uh, we were shooting all the Iona basketball games in 1978 and 1979. And I realized that I had uh, an affinity for the camera. It just was a natural thing. I could move the camera well. And uh, I had a buddy named Danny Visconti who, they only, we only had two cameras, and it was all cable. So you put the truck outside, you pull the cable inside the gym, and we had a camera underneath on the side of the basket, on the floor, and then one way up between the bleachers that were shooting a wide shot. And basically you didn't have to do anything. You never, you never went in from that wide shot because they needed something to cut from. So, uh, and it was a duel between me and my buddy Danny, who was going to be on the floor every time, and, and I won, because <laughs> I just had a better sense of how to follow the ball to the basket and then follow it back out, the player going back down the court. Much of what you see when you watch a sports game, but you probably don't pay much attention to because you're so used to these guys doing really excellent and stellar work. I was good at that. Uh, there is the sound department, which is very, very, very important to your film. Um, and that's the department that I try to stay close to, and I try to, you're always hearing what they do as a director, they give you headsets. You can either direct in two ways. You can direct through a monitor. Sometimes the video camera will have, a, the camera will have a video tap on it, and you can sort of frame it uh, with the monitor. And nowadays, even cameramen have a little, little screen, two-inch screen on top of their digital camera. So sometimes they even just look at that screen to frame things up, as opposed to old school way of looking at the viewfinder. Uh, but the sound department's really important because I know firsthand how that can really mess up your film. It's really important when you think of all the elements, when you close your eyes, and you think about your senses, you know, we don't often give our senses equal weight or equal bearing. So close your eyes for a minute. Why not? Just, we can just do that. So you're, now you're down to, what senses do you have left? Sounds. What else? Smell. Smell. What else? Touch. Touch. Taste. Good taste. Good. Good. So you can probably guess from your hearing where I'm at in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So these, these are the kind of senses that you have to develop when you're doing film. You have to really be aware of the available world, the available world around you. You can open your eyes now. And that tells you a lot. Film is a visual medium. Never would want you to close your eyes while you were trying to make a film. But I would want you to take a second to close your eyes to see if your all of your senses are really working. In sync, in tandem. Sound is really important. Did a film called Nothing to Lose. I was in a car with a great acting partner um, chasing Tim Robbins and Martin Lawrence around Los Angeles. But everything we did was in a car. John C. McGinley and I shot it all at nights. And I think, gosh, if I remembered it, around, it was around the time that you were born. My goodness. Uh, it actually was. Uh, I, I can't believe it's been that long. It's like 15 years ago. Maybe a little longer. But uh, I remember because we stopped shooting for a couple of days because Martin had some problems. And right in that break, Shane was born. But I mention this because uh, uh, six months later, film is a long process. Okay, you got that? It's a long process. And you're going to have to pick it up to do your five-minute film. You're going to have to be as quick as I am talking right now. <laughs> I'm trying to impart a lot of information in a short period of time. Film takes time. Three and a half years for me to co- well, co-write, fix the script that I received for Gospel Hill. Three and a half years later, I get the financing 
I go shoot the movie, I want 30 days to do it, I get 19 days, so I've got to sort of scrunch the time, lose what I think is superfluous, really use what I think is going to lend to the message of the story, shoot down there maybe for a three weeks prep, which is not unheard of, usually you're in six week prep period, down in Carolina, we shot this film in Rock Hill, South Carolina, for 30 days, shot 19 days, wrapped out, then came back, shot the movie. Okay, now what do I do? Well, now you go into a little dark room with the person you choose to be your editor and an editor's assistant, and you spend nine months there. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Nine months with your monitors, and if, depending on how you're cutting the film, could be on a steam back. Your next important arena is editing. And then you, so you sit there and you edit the movie. Sound. Let me finish with sound. Because then you have to sort of figure out what is the sound like? You're looking at people and you're listening to people talk to each other. But what does it sound like? What is, what, what is the message you're trying to convey? What is the sound supposed to do? And we see a lot of movies, big Hollywood movies, which, you know, something happens, there's going to be some tension happening, and all of a sudden, the music comes up and it swells. It's telling you how to feel. So I did this movie called Nothing to Lose. A year later, I mean, yeah, almost a year later, the director had his cut. And he cut the movie together, and he had basically scored the movie, and it was time for me to go in and do uh, ADR, additional uh, sound recording. Uh, and I went in to do my ADR, or looping, and every single line that I said in the movie was distorted. Every single one. And the night before I went in to do this work, I got a call from John McGin McGinley, my scene partner. And he's the guy who's on Scrubs. He's really good on Scrubs, if anyone's ever watched Scrubs. But I don't watch too much television. But So he called me and said, did you go in yet for your ADR? I said, I go in tomorrow morning. He said, you, you are going to be so pissed. I said, why, John? He said, every line that we say in the movie, every conversation we had in this car, there was some sat noise on it. Because they put our car in a trailer, they were trailering it, there was something banging, some metal sound. The sound engineer, I, I want to say he wasn't so good, but maybe he was okay. He was an older gentleman, and we had had a couple of different battles on the set, because um, for a number of different reasons, and ironically enough, <laughs> very recently, uh, I worked on a piece in New York for Jane Rosenthal, produced by Robert De Niro, called The 22, a television show. And we'll get to talk about TV in a minute. And I met this gentleman's son, who I recognized from this movie, not realizing that this guy was, was uh, his son. And I had a few battles with this guy, and his son came to me and said, oh, how are you? And I looked at him, and I said, what, don't I know you? He said, yes, nothing to lose. I said, wow. He said, yeah, uh, you and my father had a big fight in the middle of the night in L.A., in downtown L.A., because he wanted you to turn your mic on, and you turned it off. Now, we're sitting in this car for hours, and being savvy as I am, before I had a personal conversation with my scene partner sitting next to me, I'd reached my pack and I'd turned the sound off. And uh, this guy's father got so pissed at me. Turn your mic on. I said, no, I'm having a personal conversation. Before we start, I'll turn on the mic. And uh, a lot of sound guys just hate that. And he came over and yelled at me. And I was playing a very volatile character. So I immediately opened the door and jumped out. And I said, you, you should just get out of my face. We had a whole confrontation. I said, this is the first thing. He, get him out of here. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, I, about a month ago, I met his son, and, I, and he says, oh, yeah, you had a fight with my father. I said, that was your father? He said, yeah, he's retired now. I was like, oh, my goodness. And uh, I said, do you know that every line in that movie that I said was distorted? He said, no, it couldn't have been. I said, it is. I said, I want your father's number. I want to call him. I want to apologize for speaking to him. But I want to find out what happened to his sound. Because, you know, when you have another track and you have to put it on, uh, on the actual film track, it sounds differently. Yes, we do get room tone, we do get wild sound, but all that's got to be blended a certain way. And it's very important for me to preserve my original performance as an actor. I didn't know much of this until, I mean, I knew a lot of it, but I knew more of it when I was sitting in that little dark room for nine months trying to make my own movie and realizing that I had certain sounds on one track, certain sounds on the other track, and couldn't blend some of them needed actors to come in and do ADR, I, I learned from experience. And that experience um, will always guide you to be a better filmmaker or to decide what you might do best. It's important to figure this out. Some of you are writers. Some of you are, are, are naturally writers. 
Others of you might be have really good ears, and you may want to be in the sound department, which is really an interesting place to be. There is the sound department that's on the set that records everything you do, either through a mic on your tie or in your shirt or a boom mic. And then there is the, the sound, um, the resources that you have when you're in the editing room, the Foley artists, a whole other piece of artwork that literally puts in all the steps that you take. Because when you can kind of think of it, when you're walking and they're booming you here, they're not really hearing your feet as clearly as they'd like to. They're not really hearing you open a door or put the phone down. All, all that is put in. It's all put in later. All those sounds. So, <laughs> what's that? Is that the period? That's period eight is ending. It's going to ring again in about three minutes. I've got um, two students that you didn't leave in Chandler. You have to leave? Yeah. See you later. Um, period nine. Are we getting any, we getting any new recruits? Anyone new coming in? I don't think so. Don't think so. Good to have you. Good attention to the following students to the main office. Sarah Moore, Shannon Kelly, Matt Lydon, Kristen Why do these Valero. have to go to the office? They are? <laughs> uh, something's dropped Patrick off. Patrick Martin, got something. Mike Rose, Lindsay um, Hoffman, Matt Just while we're taking a break here, Nicholas, I've got a big short Nolte, film. James yeah. Simmons, all to the main it's office. It's Breaking Bad Lee. All right. There will be a meeting English for the class of 2012 on Thursday, October 13th at 263 at 7 p.m. Patrick Martin, Caitlin McGovern, and Jeff Skoladenko all to the main office. I just got a uh, script from uh, College Humor. Oh, they wanted to spoof. Oh, nice. So they wanted to spoof uh, a piece on Breaking Bad. I kind of said no because I don't think it's funny enough. Okay. Uh, but I have to revisit visit that today. So if any of you guys come up with any ideas that might be funny using my character, Gus Spring, for Breaking Bad, uh, uh, let me know. I, I just would like to say, it's nice to see you smile. <laughs> <laughs> you scare the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my job. And, uh, you know, if I do it well, that, that certainly means something. Uh, Breaking Bad's been a great experience for me, and I've got had the opportunity to work with some really awesome filmmakers. Um, and although I, I was thinking I'd show you a, a piece from uh, my film, uh, there's also a piece, the 11th episode of Breaking Bad, which I'm extremely proud of, which probably uh, could teach you a lot as well. Um, and I could, I think I have it here. We could show show you, yeah, I think I do have uh, a couple of scenes from that that I really think are stellar filmmaking, even though it's television. I, I look at Breaking Bad as us doing mini movies every single week. And 411 to me was a special, complete episode. So you, when you think about making a movie, you think um, you have to make a lot of choices as a director. You have to choose and collaborate with many different people. You become part of a family of filmmakers, and you have to trust those folks. You can't, you know, if I don't know how to operate the Niagara of sound, and you can all learn how to do that, and that's why this time in, in this particular class is so good for each and every one of you, because it's the, it's the opportunity and the chance you'll have now to learn about a whole many different um, departments in film. And the more you can learn about each department, the better off you're going to be and the more excited you'll be about making movies. So when you make your, your short films, um, don't feel bad if you haven't been chosen as the director or the, the first AD is another very important role in keeping uh, in line what you do. It's furthering what you do as a director and being the director's liaison, being someone that the director can trust to say, to get the set quiet to set up your shot, to call action and cut, although I love to do that as a director myself, but you, you, the responsibility is not always on the director. Some directors are soft-spoken and they don't want to call action and cut. They want to look at their first D AD and have them do it. Um, cinematography, light. Part of what I love about episode 411 in, in Breaking Bad are a couple of moments that are so strong, not because of me or my acting scene partner or just the writing. They're strong because of the visual effect that they have on you. Film is a visual medium, and you want to tell it, the story, in a visual way. Some of you may have great talent as writers, but some that may not translate to film because maybe you say too much. Maybe you want to say a little bit less 
And in saying less, you're saying more by playing into the visual nature of film. How many people in here take photographs? Awesome. How many of you are familiar with, uh, with uh, a photographer by the name of Robert Frank? Check Robert Frank's workout. Uh, Robert Frank is an incredible photographer who, how many of you shoot in black and white ever? Yeah. So this gives you an idea. Black and white photography is a, is a favorite of mine. Photography in general is a favorite of mine because everything that gets put together in film is a series of frames, a series of snapshots. Have you guys ever seen those, those books that you can just, you know, kind of, you know, uh, what do you call it? You can kind of just whisk through it, like just have the pages go, what is that called? Flip through it. A flip book and, and the pictures change. Well, that's basically early film. Um, film early on was, uh, the story of film was told through a, a kinesiscope. It was a, it was a scoped mechanism that was round, kinescope. And it just put these frames together. But you put the frame in there and you'd spin it and one would go to the next. So you were doing that idea of 24 frames per second. All these frames which give you the picture. If you're inclined with a camera through photography, and you love photography, um, black and white or color, it's going to help you understand framing and understand film in a much stronger and more connected way. And so, again, the director of photography um, has a great important role to play in each of your own films that you make because uh, you're, if you're using available light, which I love, available light is a great name for a company, available light. <laughs> You'll have to use available light many, many times because you won't have access or have money to get lights. But when you're able to afford lights and get a good director of photography, he's able to set those lights in a way that give you the, the look, the color, uh, the shading, the background uh, of what you want to see. So very important to think about the idea of light and dark and in, in my film, I had worked out where I wanted to use three different film stocks, which is also something different. Uh, Inaratu did it uh, on one of his films, and I, I kind of wanted to use 16 millimeter film. I really wanted to shoot 35 in a certain area of my movie, and then I wanted to use 16 millimeter because it had a grainy look. 16 is a little grainier, and I was shooting in the south. So, and my, my story takes place uh, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, uh, it takes place 40 years after the assassination of a very prominent civil rights leader, and I wanted to use some civil rights footage. Originally, I wanted to shoot that footage, and then I realized I didn't want to go back and do shoot that again when it was all at the Library of Congress, and I could create the same feeling by getting footage that was already historically available. And I didn't want to uh, put people in harm's way in reshooting some of the civil rights marches that happened uh, because I didn't know if I could really do that. It was really, really hard. And why do that when I had available footage? But I used this footage that I got from the Library of Congress to mix into my movie. And then I did shoot some period footage with Samuel L. Jackson um, and a couple of other actors that had to, to tell my original story that I cut through the whole movie. So it's an important aspect of my film to sort of get the feeling of those 60s civil rights movement marches and to create that grainy kind of look. And then I was shooting in a part of town that was really depressed. 40 years after this assassination, in my movie, there is a section of town where the civil rights leader's son is left behind. He doesn't want anything to do with going back out and sort of changing what's happening now. And that's that a golf course wants to come in and, and take out the whole historical part of this town, Gospel Hill. For that part of the movie, I wanted to shoot sepia. I wanted it to have a sepia kind of look. I thought it was important to create that look because it was so poor in that part of town. And then in the rich part of town, I wanted to just use, uh, I wanted to use um, Fuji film. Kodak was really good at night. I tested all the film. And Fuji was really good in the day to create a white, crisp, upscale look. So I wanted to blend all these different mixtures of film. I could not. I wasn't able to because of money. So I was able to use certain uh, filters on my camera to give me the sepia look. 
certain filters and lighting to make it look a little brighter when I wanted to shoot another section of the movie. And then when I was outside in certain areas, um, I shot 16 millimeter and it helped me. Anyone know what a, um, what a digital transfer is, a blow up? You have to blow up your film. Like today, many things are done digitally. And, um, and when you're shooting on film today, especially 16 millimeter, you do uh, a negative transfer. So you sort of take the 16 millimeter film and you blow it up to 35. And in blowing it up, because you shot it on 16, it becomes extremely grainy. And it gives you that, like, sometimes you'll see a film where it's really supposed to be really, really, really hot. And you see sort of the, the air and the, the, is glistening off pavement. It gives you that kind of look. And that's what I wanted for my movie to create the new and the old and then create the new world uh, that was coming in to try to take over uh, and um, gentrify this historical neighborhood in, in my film, Gospel Hill. Uh, I love the idea, so we've talked about a lot of things here, and I'm giving it to you pretty fast and furious, uh, but I think the things you should remember are, well, let me just say something, you know, film is, is a hot medium, it is a creative medium. It's, it allows you to say, to use your voice and as a group and family of filmmakers, as a director, your job is to get everybody on the same page and to allow them to become their best selves. It truly is. So as a director, I work with many. Uh, and I find some to be dictators, others to be collaborators. And I think the best thing to be as a director is a collaborator. If you know it all, then there's no room to learn any more. Uh, if you agree that you still have something to learn, as I do for myself after 47 years of being an actor and being around professionals uh, and working with professionals, I still have a lot to learn. And that creates an opening to be able to listen, to be able to share. And that's what filmmaking is. You're looking to be with people that you really like. You're looking to be with people that you can communicate with. It's about communicating. If you have an idea, you have to get it across. You have to share it. And you have to see if that idea resounds for someone else besides just yourself. And if it does, then you know you might be on the right track. And then to formulate that idea and take that formulation and to put it on a big screen with the help of all the family of filmmakers is a, is a really, it's a large task. It takes attention. And that attention is in all the details. And if you don't let that process swallow you up as a director, you begin to sort of know and learn how to transfer through your words and your feelings your vision. And you take that vision and you share it. And when it becomes a shared vision, you're able to take all these little pieces and put them together. Again, uh, a year in the editing room is a long time. And you can shoot one movie, and you can really put together a whole different movie. Uh, in the editing room. So, the technical aspect of the film is a great one. It's, and it's good for you to learn something about that technical aspect. This opportunity here is gonna allow you to do that. More so than even when you become a director or a sound person or a director of photography or a focus puller, very important, the focus is right. Um, in, in my day when I came up, focus pullers were right off the camera. They worked very closely with the cameraman and your DP will set the shot. Some director of photography, DPs, like to shoot the first shot because most of those guys have been operators, or girls have been operators. Uh, they're, and they become the director of photography, but they should know how to set a shot, shoot a shot. And so it's important, and believe me when I tell you, take this opportunity to heart. This is probably the only time you're gonna have the opportunity to be the cameraman, to be the sound person, to be the director of photography, to pull cable, to be a grip, to push the dolly. How important it is to have a guy at the end of that dolly who is smooth, who's in touch with their physical body, to be able to push the dolly at a certain pace and move the camera where it needs to be. Very, very important position, extremely important. Okay, if anyone saw episode 411 in, in, 
in Breaking Bad, there's a moment that the 411 blows my mind. Because this episode, we've done 13 episodes this season, you've seen three other seasons, but this episode is the quintessential episode of television. It is so well paced, the direction is so good by Scott Winant, the music is fantastic. The choices that were made musically are phenomenal. The acting from everyone was phenomenal. It's one of those episodes like your film, my film, any film you make. When it all comes together, it's sort of like a <gasps> experience. It's like a wow experience. Because you know, you may get there with certain things you have in your mind as a director that you want to do. You may get there, you may not. You may get halfway there. But this episode 411 really got there. And, and at one point in this episode, toward the end, before I meet my demise, uh, I'm with Hector Salamanca, or Tio, and I turn around and take the chair, which I've done many times, to sit in front of him. But this time, when I move that chair, did anyone see this episode? What happened? Um, I'm trying to remember what exactly happened in that episode, because you... Wait, oh, you mean when you came with Jesse? No, when I came, no, when I came in, in episode 11, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Bernie Desire, okay. It was so jarring. It, with this, when we first come into Salamanca in the nursing home, yeah. the noise, I didn't know what it was. It sounded like a freight train. It's, it, exactly. It was just... The sound recording, the director had them put in screech until the chair stopped. It was amazing. Truly, truly amazing. And, and that's what you could do. With film. Now, it didn't sound like that when I was doing it in the room. Of course, there was a little screech, and I made it louder because it was an idea I had, but he took it to the nth degree. Oh, yeah, that was, it was amazing. Jarring. Equally so, jarring. when Walter is down uh, in, on the basement floor, on the dirt floor looking up, and he's screaming for Skyler. Skyler's standing, and, and, and all of a sudden, it sounds like he's talking to her, but they've taken his voice and put it really far away, which made me think, oh, she's not hearing him. And he's talking to her, and she's not hearing him. And he's saying, Skylar, don't you blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, the music underneath that rises and gets so very loud. And he finally says, Skylar! And the music cuts out. And all you hear is them breathing. And then they start their conversation. See, this is what you can do with film. Uh, and I, I think it's really important to learn that when you have an idea, share it. Don't feel like it's not a big enough idea, or don't feel like it's an idea that won't work. Equally so, in the scene with, with Gus and Walter in the desert, there's a, they're on a wide shot. It takes a lot of trust and faith to stay in a wide shot, because we're so used to, as an audience, um, we're used to having quick cuts, being close up, seeing everything. Camera's always moving. Camera's always, and our style on Breaking Bad is that you have a camera that's on a guy's shoulder. So you want that kind of fluid, you're in the scene feeling. That's why you put the camera on someone's shoulder. But you don't want it to be shaky like we used to do in the late 80s, 90s. We'd have that very jarring camera on someone's shoulder. This you want just to be able to be natural. Like I'm in a conversation just sort of talking and you feel it from the camera. So to go away from that style in that scene with Gus and Walter in the uh, Gus and yeah Gus and Walter in the desert, it took trust. So Walter's on his knees and he has a black hood over his head and you're on a wide shot while Gus's car drives in, and and you stay there and you stay there and you stay there until he gets out of the car. He walks over to Walter, then you cut to uh, Walter in a medium close-up on his knees. Until the point where Gus, well, now they stay there, pulls off his hood. And you're still close up on Walter. Until the point where Walter says something Gus doesn't like. And then you're on a medium shot of Gus, the opposite of what you had on Walter. Right? And as Walter said, and then he cut back to Walter and he says something about, what are you going to do? Kill me? And at that moment, he goes back to the wide shot. I mean, it's really wide. And we're really small in frame. Walter on the ground, Gus standing up. And he stays in that wide shot for most of the scene. The voices become more present. They get closer to you, like you're right in our conversation, like you're closer than you really are, but he stays in the wide shot. And there's a moment where, where Walter says, what are you going to do, kill me? And it's sunny outside. And then as he says, kill me, 
the cloud rolls over and it gets dark. And I'm sitting there going, oh my god, this is incredible. And he stays there. And he stays there. And he stays there. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this director's amazing. How? He trusted. He trusted himself. And he stays there so long that we're still talking. And then what happens? It's as if the cloud rolls back, literally, the darkness rolls away, and there's sunlight again. And he's still in that wide shot. That, you know, this director, Scott Winding, was wonderful. He really trusted himself to do that. And then I had, finally had lunch with Vince Gilligan, and I said, I want to know more about this episode. There were, there were five more moments like this in this particular episode, which makes it one of the best in its rhythm and its timing, where the writing, the lighting, the acting, the sound, the editing. Our editor is Skip McDonald. If any of you want to be an editor, it's one of the important, most important positions ever on a film. I speak to my editor every three months to try to let her know when my next film is going to happen. Um, I, I, I think she's the right one to do it. I'm not quite sure, but I've developed such a close relationship with her. Your editor is most important on any film that you do because you want them to understand your vision, and they're the ones who are able to cut your vision properly. And that's going to be your best friend and your worst enemy because the editor will tell you, no, this doesn't work. You know, we, we can't do this. So when I talk to Vince Gilligan about this moment, in this scene that I was so excited about, uh, I realized that I said, you know, I'm really in admiration for this guy, Scott Winant. As a director, you, you shoot it, you take it away, and then you really create it, you really make it in the editing room. That's where you really make your movie, because you can change the whole film. That's why I said earlier, film is a director's medium, theater is an actor's medium, television is a director's medium. And a, a medium that's determined by coalition. Television is such a very expensive medium that there are 10 producers and they all have to sign off on how you look and what you're saying and they're always up, they're right on you as a director. You have no space, no room, they want to make sure they got one shot at you, you got eight days to shoot uh, a television show and they don't want you to make a mistake and so they have a million people looking over your shoulder and they're going to ask you questions that you have to be able to answer and if you can't answer them, I like to say, I don't know, let's find it together. So, in this moment with Vince, I said, you know, Vince, who did that? And Vince said to me, well, you know, as a director in television, you're not able to cut the film that way. It's too dramatic. It's too, you'd have to ask the showrunner, because the showrunner sets up the way the TV show works. So he said, I'm glad you really love Scott's work, but he didn't get, that's not the cut that I got. As a, in t television, as a director, you take, you do your cut with the editor. We happen to have a great editor, Skip McDonald. Then you give it to them, and then they take your work and they mess with it. They take your work and they go, "This works. This doesn't work." They change it. You have what four days to give your cut, and so it's very different than film. You know, this film, I'm proud to say, it's my cut. It's what I want. After having struggled with it and having them shut me down in the editing room and taking my film away. And I was smart enough to have a final version because I had a feeling we were going to run out of money. So I made the version that I could live with at the moment in time that I knew they were going to snatch my movie. And they did. And they, they were like, you know, it's, we don't have any more money. This took too much time and this, that, and the other. I said, I'm almost finished. I have five days left. We want you to fire your editor. I said, why? I said, uh, she's good. They said, well, you know, there's got to be more, there's got to be something you're not getting uh, from her. And I said, well, let me share this with you. I bought in four editors. I work with my editor, and I anticipated this happening. So I bought in Fred Skepsky's uh, editor. He's a great filmmaker. I bought in, uh, uh, oh my gosh, John, um, another great, wonderful, John Sales's editor. I bought in all these, I invited them in on different days and said, watch my movie. Give me some suggestions. And, and these editors came in and said, you know, I can suggest this and this and this. They said, but basically use every piece of footage you have. And, you know, it's just about a choice of whether to add this, this, or this, or take this or this away. So when, when, I, when they finally did close my editing room down, I had copies for all the producers that were left. I was one of the producers on my own movie. But, uh, and they all watched it. It was very different than the cut they saw on Friday. On Tuesday, I gave another cut, and I closed up when I left. And I got a call three days later saying, where was this version? I said, I said, this version was always in there. This is the version I made that I feel I could live with if you're not going to let me finish my movie. 
and they're mousetrap. They said, this is fantastic. I said, well, you know, movies are made in very different ways. And if you will allow me to finish this movie, we can have some test screenings, we can move on from there. And they did allow me to go back up with my same editor, because it's the only way I'll finish this movie, and we finished the film together. So for television, Vince said to me, a director could never make those decisions. I came across this. And I said, how did, how did that happen? Well, he said, I was looking at the footage on a steam bed, and we were rolling through it really fast, really, really quickly, the whole, the whole scene, all the footage from the scene. And as I'm looking at it, I'm realizing this dramatic light change. And so I decided that let's go back. That's, that light change happened in the wide shot. Let's go back, stay in the wide shot, and let's figure out how to use that light change. So what he did was he found that sitting in that wide shot it was a two and a half minute shot but it was too long, so we had to cut something out of it. This is where your editor and your technical abilities are so very, and your eye, so very important. So he started to try to cut pieces out of that one shot and jump cut it so that you couldn't tell that he just jumped. So he was able to accomplish jump cutting within the scene to blend it, to make it look like he never made any cuts at all. But there was one moment where one of the, cause, because I was very still. Your actors have to be extremely still. Because he was in that wide shot, and I didn't move, and uh, Brian didn't move either. He was able to accomplish it, but except for one moment where he, he was in that wide, and somewhere behind Brian is a bodyguard, and he kind of moves. One of those jump cuts, his, his body moves. Uh, so if you're looking really closely, you can tell he's, he had, not only did he jump cut twice into that wide shot, but he also sped the film up a little bit, so the time would go down. So to me, this scene, just the technical aspects of what he did, I wanted to learn about. So I asked Vince, Vince said it was my decision because um, I, I wanted to make it more, I wanted the scene, the scene was so aggressive, but I wanted it to be played out on a, on a wide, wide scale. How many people in the room have painted before? Yeah, this is really good. You know, I started painting when I was eight years old, nine years old. My mother had me start using oil paints to calm me down, to paint ocean, to paint sky. Painting is really, really important to your filmic view and your eye, developing your color scheme. As a, as a director, I chose a color pattern for each character in my movie, depending on what their emotional arc was. So I would make notes, and I'd take cray pods, and I would take a paper and I'd put that character's name up there, which helped me to dress that character, to, to realize what colors they were in, and what color palette I wanted for the whole movie, and then what color pal palette I wanted for each character. Um, really, really important to think about, and it can make a whole heck of a lot of difference in your movie creatively when you're sitting in that little room and you've made the choices uh, that you've made while you shot it, and there's a whole new set of choices that you probably want to make while you are in the editing room to create your movie. And lastly, but not leastly, I, I know we're going on time, so I want to be able to show something. Sure. And I want you, you to ask. Load that? Yeah, would you load it sure. for me? Mm. Uh, we could show, um, yeah, why don't we show just the opening, a little bit of the opening of Gospel. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a lot of different things that you're not going to be asked to think about all at once. You know, when I was on my movie set, I said, look, I'm, I'm a new director. I want everyone to collaborate with me, but I want you, you know, also to, to know that come with me, to me with anything. Share with me your hope and desire for what you see. Um, I had a good relationship with my wardrobe mistress or designer who disagreed with me quite a bit. And sometimes she was right, sometimes she wasn't. But I said, I'll take all the suggestions I need to take, uh, but in the end, just know that no matter what department you're on or in, that sometimes the, the, the person that has to make the creative decision is the director. And you'll probably all get a chance to be that. But it's really important to know that, um, oh good, it's there, that that is a part of your job, is to take the best, leave the rest, and put all your, your visionary ideas on film. So here's a piece of my movie, Gospel Hill. We'll just look at a little bit of it. I can tell you how I got to do that. Then I want you, I want to open it up for some Q&A. Yeah.
is it? It's a reporter from Aiken wants to talk to you about the memorial. Ah, uh, I'm not interested. Uh, just something brief about your father. I got nothing to say. Mr. Harris, um, I'm sorry. He's not a man. He came back positive, which I wouldn't call a surprise. I've also got to tell you the cancer spread. Now, I think the only option we have now is chemotherapy or radiation. These are anti-androgens. I want you to start taking them right away. We've got to start you on chemo as soon as possible. Now, you can't fool around here. If you don't act on this, you might not be around in six months. Do you hear me? Here in the town of Julia, South Carolina, the citizens of the Air to celebrate the life of civil rights activist Paul Malcolm. Next Tuesday marks the 40th anniversary of his tragic death. Some may remember his famous lunch counter protest, where he was arrested for pointing out the injustice of segregation. Paul Malcolm was a true local hero. His legacy will be honored next Tuesday at Friendship Park. He got his son, John Adams, and Taylor Lewis. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello? Yes. Of course I remember you and your lovely family. Uh-huh. How's the earache? Are you? No. Oh, big one. Did your parents teach you to knock? the driver's complaints. I got complaints too. What about the fact that you're late more than you are on time and when you are here, you flap your lips more than you work. You don't talk to me that way. Okay, you're fired. You can't fire me. I just did. What am I supposed to do for a job in this town? Why don't you go back to El Don or you can cry about your leg to somebody. Go talk to the VA. You'll get a job that worked here, didn't you? Fuck you.
labor of love to make this movie and to have it turn out as well as it did. Um, one of the great things about what, that I love about filmmaking is that it not only takes the audience on a journey, uh, but it also uh, takes me as a director on a journey. And, you know, we shoot a lot inside big rooms called studios where we can create our world, um, but the world that I really love to inhabit is the world that's already existing. And to discover that, as filmmakers is, is one of the, the most amazing things to me. So remember that when you make your short films that you um, are looking at things in, in after you had them written, of course, utilize what's already here. Utilize the interesting background in the neighborhood where you live, and that will enable you to sort of see that background sort of play out um, in the movie you make in on location. To me, being on location is an amazing thing. This last scene here between Tom Bauer, who's an incredible actor, uh, and um, Danny Glover, another wonderful actor you may have seen in the Lethal Weapon series. Uh, Angela Bassett's in the movie. Uh, and and the, the footage that you saw that was um, black and white, which I shot as black and white um, uh, in Super 16 and some in Super 8, uh, is Samuel L. Jackson. Um, and I blended that footage with footage I got, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from um, the, um, from Washington, uh, and it, it almost looks like it was shot at the same time. It looks kind of perfect. Um, and all that footage was shot in the back lot of Sony Pictures in California because Sam couldn't make it down to Carolina. Um, this film I made is a very slow-paced, deliberately slow-paced investigation of the aftermath of what happens in a small town uh, when you have a civil rights leader's son, a civil rights leader who was assassinated, his eldest son, played by Danny Glover, uh, and the sheriff at that time was Tom Bauer. In the footage that you saw um, that went back, the young man who was saying, come on, let's go, or putting the cuffs on him, and he said, well, we, we should go, is uh, the younger Tom Bauer. Um, so he's the sheriff who allowed this assassination to happen. There is... Um, it's been inferred that he knew something about it and didn't stand up and do anything. So the film is a, a quiet investigation of how do we heal after this kind of extreme tragedy has happened 40 years before in the light of gentrification on the backdrop of the historic part of town that's about to be gentrified and made into a golf course. That's um, the civil rights leader's son's home and Angela Bassett's son. So it becomes um, kind of a full story in that regard, and uh, yeah, just two questions. Sorry, yeah, um, right. the gospel singing that is overlaid with the two types of film that you have, it just it ties them together seamlessly for me. Uh, it's wonderful stuff. Did you have? Where did you find them? And uh, how'd you come across the script? Well, I um, I, I first I came across the script from a, a a guy who worked in the wardrobe department of Homicide Life of the Street. And I'd done the seventh year of that show, uh, and. Years later, he, uh, his name is Sammy, he sent me the script and asked me if I wanted to consider being in it. And I get that all the time. And I said, yeah, I would consider it, let me read it. I read it, I loved it. And then they called me and said, do you like it? I said, yes. And they said, what role do you think you want to play? And I said, Dr. Palmer, who was the guy who was selling off his own people's land. Doctor eventually starts to sell his own people's land, buys it from the poor in his neighborhood because they can't afford their mortgages, and sells it to the big conglomerate it's about to take over the whole neighborhood. And they were surprised. They said, well, why do you want to play that role? Why don't you want to play Paul Malcolm? And I said, well, because I'm not Paul Malcolm. Well, you're an actor. You, I said, I could play Paul Malcolm, but that's not the way I see Paul Mal Malcolm. 
And it was out of these next conversations that led them to ask me if I wanted to direct. I said, I see Paul Malcolm as a big guy, someone who could have worked in the fields, worked with his father, and he's just a little bit different than me. And they said, what else do you see? And I started to say, well, I see it like this. And I think there are too many characters in the movie. And I went on and on and on. And they got off the phone and said, okay, thanks. Um, so I said, but the thing to do is, get me a letter of intent. Get me a letter that says, you know, um, that you want me to do the movie. Um, if you get the financing, I'll say I'll do it. And go off and get your money and come back and call me then. Well, they called up back a week later and said, would you like to do anything else on this movie? Good afternoon. And the following students I said I would love to direct it. Rocket, That's how that started. Oscar Fernandez, um, Matthew Hanrau, I started Hanrell, to look at the whole product Rose, in a different way. Patrick Martin. And I said the only way I'll do this Caitlin McGovern, is if I can rewrite Danko. the script with the original writer. So here again, I honor the word. Thank you. Have and a nice afternoon. They said yes. I started working with Jeff Stacy, who wrote the script, to make it better. And through that investigation of working with him, I gained a great deal of knowledge in regard to how you take something and finesse it. How you take a project and finesse it. I'm sorry, some of these guys got sports that they're going to totally do. Totally understand. Get a bus, so if you are going to hang it on here, do it now. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I started watching some of last night, and I got to Thank you. Uh-huh. Nice to meet you. You're very welcome. You're welcome. Very well. Okay. Yes, I wanted to open that up. We You're very smart because Spike did um, move the movie toward the feeling of Malcolm X, that, that violence could um, actually change things. And so he's more fond of Malcolm's philosophy than he was of, of Martin Luther King's nonviolent philosophy. So you're right. And, and this is what you can do as a director. 